Praise the Lord. When the plane came down today in Ontario, I simply spoke out and said, Jesus, I come to this area in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It's the only way to come and it's the only way to go. In the name of Jesus. The Lord spoke to me this afternoon to preach something to you. And I feel at the beginning of this conference, if you can grasp this, you may be on your way to great and wonderful exploits in God. I was telling Brother Buxton today, writing here from the airport, it's now or never for us. It's now or never. If we don't do it now, we're never going to do it. We have to do it now. This is our hour and this is our day. It's a privilege to be here and to preach to you and to feel what I feel in this wonderful and noble assembly. Noble because we are among sons and daughters of the King tonight. Ambassadors for Christ we are. What a tremendous assembly. What a wonderful presence to be in tonight. The amazing thing about us is, if you're here visiting, you'd never guess this by looking at us, but we come from all walks of life, all kinds of horrible, miserable, and wonderful backgrounds. I talked to a man in the wing of this stage tonight, a platform, who told me he got the Holy Ghost in prison, was there for armed robbery. Now he's preaching in the prison, baptizing others in Jesus' name, and they're receiving the Holy Ghost. But to look at us here tonight, you'd never guess where we came from. Because don't you understand, it's all been covered over by the blood. It's all been covered over. Nobody would ever guess. Nobody would ever know where some of us came from. God took our sins away and cast them into a sea of forgetfulness. Then he posted a big sign that says no fishing. And nobody will ever drag it out. We are what we are tonight by the grace of a wonderful and mighty God. That's why we shout and that's why we run. That's why we dance. And that's why we make no apologies to anybody. We know where we were. We know where we are. And we know where we're going. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. I want to read to you tonight from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61 and verse 1. It's a privilege to be with Brother and Sister Buxton. They are wonderful people of God. And I feel a kindred spirit to these people. <clears throat> and I'm sure you do, do also. The Bible says in Isaiah, chapter 61 and verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Jesus quoted that scripture in the Gospel of Luke chapter 4 and applied it to himself. He said in Luke 4 and verse 18, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised. I want to talk to you tonight about deliverance. It's interesting to note that in Hebrew it was translated into the word liberty, but in Greek it was translated into the word deliverance. Would you pray with me before you're seated? Lord Jesus, tonight I pray, O oh God, that you would walk in the aisles of this place, that you would touch us individually and collectively. I'm asking tonight that you would anoint these lips of clay 
and caused me to speak as the oracle of the Lord that the power and the glory of God will be manifested in this place. We will not fail to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. Help us in Jesus' name to receive, to believe, to understand, and to give forth. We will not fail to praise you, O Master of the universe. We ask it in the wonderful name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. The Lord bless you. Thank you for standing so long. Would you clap for the Lord and worship Him tonight? <laughs> Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. That really was pitiful, you know that? Do it again. <laughs> Let's clap our hands and worship the Lord. There's nobody here but us and Jesus. Oh, hallelujah! Hallelujah! Hallelujah, Jesus! Hallelujah, Jesus! Hallelujah, Jesus! Hallelujah, Jesus! Hallelujah, Jesus! It's interesting to note that Isaiah would make such a glorious proclamation and prophecy about the coming of the Messiah. He simply predicted and prophesied that the Messiah would bring liberty, liberty to the captives. That would mean a great deal to the Jews because their history, for the most part, had been captivity. The greater portion of their history, even to this day, has been captivity, enslavement, persecution, slaughter of one kind or another. And so for a Jewish ear to hear that the Messiah, when he came, would bring liberty, he would bring freedom to them, would be a glorious thing for them to hear and to encounter. If tonight we look back at the Jewish nation in their very beginning, they were nothing more than a bunch of Bedouins who traversed from one place to another under Abraham and his immediate sons. God knew that from a wandering Bedouin tribe, he could never bring together a nation. And God in his divine providential care, and sometimes in ways we do not understand, God sent those Jews into bondage under an Egyptian pharaoh who did not know Abraham or his sons. This king placed those Jews in slavery. But in slavery or in persecution, those Jews grew from about 70 souls to some five or six million strong, according to the authority or reference that you read after. There is no way for me to tell you tonight with human words exactly what the Jews endured under the taskmaster's whip. It is impossible, really, to paint a word picture for you, but I want to try. Because I understand from reading the Word of God and from historical study that the Jews literally were slaves. And I have been to Egypt and I have seen some of the ruins of the treasure houses left that were erected by a people who worshipped the one true God. But they were slaves in the hands of cruel taskmasters. And these men and their families were consigned to a kind of slavery that would build monuments to a people that one day would basically become extinct or a civilization that would be no more. Because when God got done with those Egyptians, they never again would rise to power and they never will. Because the judgment of God has fallen upon them. But out of that slavery, the Jews became a mighty people, at least in number. They literally lived under the lash of the taskmaster's whip. From day to day, there was nothing better for them to face than another day of drudgery under the scorching sun of Egypt. And they would give their bodies, literally, to the mud pits and to the, shall we say, the threshing of straw and to the building of bricks and then carrying them and erecting them into various monuments and whatever. There was no hope that a Jewish father could give to his Jewish son or his daughter except that one day there will come a deliverer. It was nothing he could say that would help them for the immediate present. 
But the hope was that in the future there would come a deliverer. And so every Jewish child grew up. They grew up in slavery, not knowing the word freedom or understanding it. But they knew that someday there would come a deliverer who would set them free. Now what that meant they were not totally sure of. Because how can you know freedom if you have never experienced freedom? How can you know what freedom would be like or liberty would be like if you had never really experienced it? There were some old seers among them that could remember when they were free. They could even tell stories about Abraham, but even they died and lost their lives. And that was vanquished and that was taken away. Eventually, after a hundred years, two hundred years, three hundred years, four hundred years, the Jews really knew little or nothing about freedom. All they knew was the word and they knew something about liberty and there was going to come a deliverer or one that would deliver them from this bondage. They knew what bondage was, but couldn't really understand bondage because how can you understand bondage if you've never known freedom? How can you know freedom if you've only known bondage? And so really they just were groping, not fully understanding what was going on or what was going to happen. But there was something in them as they looked at the Egyptian taskmasters that knew there was a different way to live than what they were living in the mud pits and the brick kilns of Egypt. They understood and knew there was something better than where they were. Now how this would all come about, they were not totally confident or sure, nor could they explain it. God in his time and God is a time for everything and may I just throw this into you I believe Californian that now is your time now is your appointed hour to something greater than you have ever known before in all of your ministry in all of your Christian living would you clap for the Lord and just worship him if you believe that tonight Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. All of a sudden, the day came when God would no longer, He would no longer turn a deaf ear to the cry of His people. For they had cried out now for some 400 years that God would deliver them from this bondage. And generation after generation seemed to pass away and the heavens were brass. But there came a day, there came an hour, there came an appointed time when God spoke to His man on the backside of a Midian desert in a bush that was not consumed by fire. And He said to this man, this exile from the courts of Pharaoh, He said to him, I want you to take that staff, Moses. I want you to turn your face back to Egypt and I'm going to go with you and we're going to go in before Pharaoh and I've got a message for him. And Pharaoh was afraid. Most of us know the story. But in the end result, he acquiesced. And he walked over the desert sands again. And he went back into the courts of Pharaoh and he cried to Pharaoh, Let my people go! And it was unlike anything Pharaoh had ever heard because as far as he was concerned, he was a god. And as far as the Egyptians were concerned, he was a god. He was a nobody from nowheresville as far as Jesus was concerned back there. And his house number was zero and he lived on a dead-end street. And that's how it is for you tonight or for me if we do not know him. And Jesus was back there. (laughs) Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Through the plagues, through the besieging of the plagues and the terror of the plagues, finally Pharaoh was glad to let those Jews go. Now, here's another thing impossible for me. It is impossible for me to put into human words the scene or what happened when Joshua lifted that shofar, that ram's horn to his lips, and he blew the peal that began the exodus. When the gates of Egypt opened wide, and those Jews, their aged and their young, and the children and mothers in wagons giving birth as they left the land of bondage, and camels and donkeys and all kinds of animals, and other wagons laden with treasures and with gold. And the spoil of Egypt, they really didn't steal that from the Egyptians. It was just back pay for 400 years that they had never ever had anything. And they collected as they left the land. And as those gates of Egypt 
swung open wide and those Jews began to walk out into that clean desert air. There was a sound of freedom. There was a sound of rejoicing unlike anything that the world had ever heard. There was the sound of laughter. That desert absolutely echoed and reverberated with the cry of a people who were experiencing something they had never experienced before. There were shouts of laughter. There were there was crying. There was weeping. But there was no looking back for the moment. They were going about five or six million strong and the desert could feel and hear the footfall of a people whose God was the only true God. The one God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they began to move like a mass army. Suddenly in the heavens there was a cloud that appeared above them to shield them from the heat of the day. And that cloud turned into a pillar of fire by night. And those Jews had the divine providential care of a God who is more powerful than any human mind or tongue could ever tell. He was shielding them and protecting them as they walked toward a land a promise. At night, at the end of a day's journey, the desert still was hearing laughter and shouts of freedom and shouts that were not really distinguishable. They didn't know if that was really joy or sorrow because how do you make a joyful sound when all you've ever done is weep and cry and beg for a day like this? And when the day comes, what do you do with it? And so they built the little fires and they dragged out their food and they sat around the fire and they ate their food and then they began to sing and for the first time they were not so exhausted but what they could look up into the vast expanse of God's creation they could watch the stars twinkle they could sit and watch the fire burn down and then someone said let's sing and they dragged out a tambourine and they began to sing and they began to dance they had never danced they didn't have the strength to dance they wandered in at dark and were out at daybreak and the vigil had gone on for hundreds of years but now they could actually sleep in in the morning there was no alarm clock there was no cry from the hoarse throat of those villains in Egypt there was no cracking of the taskmaster's whip there was the sound of cattle lowing. There was the bleeding of sheep. And there was the ever-present sound of laughter and talking as the people of God were experiencing something they had never ever experienced before. There is no way to tell you what happened in the camp. There's no way to record it. There's no way to write it down. The joy and the presence and the power of a people. Their backs began to heal. And freedom was taking on a new meaning to them. This is freedom. This is what freedom is all about. We'll never have to go back to the taskmaster's whip. We will always be able to sleep in like this if we want to. We can do what we want to. And we're going to a land where there is milk and honey. I'm going to have my own fig tree. I'm going to have my own vine. I'm going to have my own little house. I can run it the way I want to run it. We're going to be a free people. And God is going to be our king. And we're going to live for him. And we're going to talk to him and we're always going to worship Him. Idealistically, it sounded glorious. But there was something about these Hebrew children, something about them, something about them that could never ever be totally right. Because in their newfound freedom, they were really unable to relate to it the way they needed to. Every time something went wrong, Every time Moses did something they didn't like. Every time God didn't come through just at the snap of their finger, they murmured. And in their thinking, they went back to Egypt. They even at points said, let's go back to Egypt. At least we got the flesh pots, and we've got the onions and the leeks and the garlics. And now here, Moses, you brought us out here to die. Different story now. Every time something went wrong... In their thinking, they went back to Egypt. There are a lot of people I know like that in this. Every time something goes wrong, every time we do something they don't like, those people will go back to the world. Friend of mine, you need to wake up and shake yourself. There's no place out there for you anymore. You're not going to get help in the world. The world will never help you. When things go wrong, you don't need to run to the world. You need to run into the arms of Jesus. He is the only one. He is the only one that will ever be able to help you. He is the only one that will ever be able to do anything for you. 
If you really believe that, I want you to clap your hands and worship the Lord with all of your might. For this God I serve tonight, this God that we serve, He is worthy. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our hand clap. He is worthy of our excitement. He is worthy of our leaping and our shouting and our dancing. He is worthy of it. He is worthy of it. He is worthy of it. For He has done great things for us. And who can deny it? He has done great things for us. Those Jews were delivered physically, but they were not delivered mentally. Their bodies were free, but their minds were in slavery. Joshua and Caleb were never looking back into Egypt. They were forever looking into Canaan. They were a minority group. There are some of us here tonight that are in a minority group. Joshua and Caleb were 40 years before their time. They were forever looking into the promised land. They had no desire to ever go back to Egypt. There was nothing about it they wanted to remember or retain. They never wanted to see it again. They were just filled with this revival. There's something about, let's cross over. Let's get into the land. Oh, let's get on with the building. Let's get down to the building a garden. Let's have a little vineyard. Let's have a fig tree orchard. Oh, let's build a house. That's where they were. Moses was not a slave. He was a leader reared in the courts of Pharaoh. Moses was not a slave. Those Jews were delivered physically, but they were not delivered mentally. And people, I don't mind telling you tonight, I have lived in this for 22 years now, there are some times when I can hardly remember what it was like to be a sinner. I am so far removed now from what I was in the world that I can hardly relate to the old me. It's been too long now. It's just been uh, too long. I no longer feel the sting and the stain of sin. I no longer feel the crack of the taskmaster's whip. I don't remember what it was like really sometimes to be in the mud pits of this world. I don't remember what it was like to be in chains in the slavery of this world. The closest I come to it sometimes is when a sinner comes in among us. And I can tell by looking at them that they have lived in the gutters of this world. And when I see them come to an altar and kneel beside them and hear them begin to cry, God, God, I am lost. There's something in me that goes back and I can remember and I can cry with them. And for just those moments in time, I can feel what they feel. But for the most part, you and I here tonight are free physically. We are totally free physically. We really are. Sin does not lurk in our bodies. It does not reign over these mortal bodies anymore. That's why we come here and clap and shout. Because when we feel the touch of God, our bodies get involved with worshiping the one true God. We will run as this man did around here tonight. We will clap. We will shout. We will sing. Because we're free. Everybody say we're free. We're free. But I fear tonight uh, that one of the stumbling blocks among us uh, that keeps us from doing exploits for God uh, is this business of in our minds, uh, though our bodies have a hold of it uh, and we can feel it, uh, yet in our thinking sometimes uh, we are not delivered in our minds. Uh, we've got to come to grips with this tonight. Uh, we've got to have a reevaluation of our thinking. Uh, people, you've got to understand in your mind, uh, I am free. I'm never going back. We're never going back. We're never going back. We don't have to go back. We don't have to be like that anymore. God will make a way where there is no way. He knows how to do it. I will believe in Him. The giants will come down. The giants will come down. The giants will come down. He'll make a way. I don't want anybody else going in and out unless you have to. There's too much running out of here. Let's clap again and worship the Lord. You don't need to be going out like that. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. 
Hallelujah, Jesus. When you move, you cut the spirit world just like that. This is a life and death situation. We're not here for just some kind of a meeting. We've got to hear from God and we've got to get a hold of God and we've got to get help. I need help. We need help here tonight. We have got to look at our minds. People, we are totally delivered in our physical situation. But in our thinking, our minds sometimes are still in this world. That's why we keep running back to it when things go bad. Have you ever wondered, why did Jesus sleep in that boat? Why, when we so desperately need him sometimes, does he seem so far away? Why, why sometimes does he seem to refrain himself from us and become so impersonal? If you know all the answers to why, you would be as wise as God and you'd never learn to walk by faith. You would never learn to walk by faith if we knew all the answers. There is a statement that I live by. I told it to Sister Tool yesterday in the Price's home. She does not understand why God took her husband when he did. I said to Sister Tool, hear this. The things that make us weep today, if we could pull them into focus and see them as God sees them, would make us smile. And sometimes the darkness you walk through is only the shadow of his hand outstretched caressingly. He is never so near as when we think he is so far away. That little old boat rocked and tossed with the wind and the waves. Those disciples were so, so cut up in their fear and their terror of that sea. And they couldn't get it together. Why was he asleep in the back of this boat? If they ever needed him, they needed him now. And he slept on. And they were struggling with the wind. And they were struggling with the waves. And still he slept. All of a sudden, desperation overwhelmed them. And they begin to cry out, Jesus! The thing that is so staggering to me is that Jesus did not hear the wind and the waves. He was slept right through it. But there was something about the cry of his disciple that when they cried, that was the thing that awakened him. You may be in the throes of a terrible storm tonight. The waves around your life may be crashing in upon you. And the wind may be howling. And there may be fear and terror in your own spiritual walk. God sometimes does not hear all of that. But if you will cry out to Him, I promise you He will hear your cry. And He will come walking to the bow of your little ship. And He will stand there and He will say to the wind of your life. He will say to the waves of your life. He will say peace be still and the wind will subside and the waves will become blessed God will leave the multitude and go to the individual there could be 1,000 people here tonight and 999 could be chanting, I don't believe, I don't believe, I don't believe. But some little old wrinkled saint could lift a frail hand and whisper, Jesus, but I believe. And Jesus would leave the multitude and he would go to the individual. He would go to that one that believed. You must hear me tonight. God came for the whole man. He came with salvation for the soul. And He came with healing for the body. But God will ask you sometime, are you saved? Are you healed? Do you have the Holy Ghost? And when He does that, it will expose us. And some of us need to be exposed. Don't you understand that faith is the power that brings into existence that which is not now? Hear me, 
I talked to someone about this today before I flew here. There will come a day when we will bypass Blue Cross and White Cross and Red Cross and come to the cross of Jesus Christ. There will come a day when all of this is going to fail us. It's beginning to fail right now. But I'm here to tell you there is a God in heaven, the same God that caused those Jews to escape. There's a God that says, I can do anything. I can do everything. Oh, if you'll just try me, if you'll just talk to me, if you will just pray to me, I'll make a way for you where there is no way. Let's clap again and worship Him. Hallelujah, Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. The prodigal son, in the story of the prodigal son, the Bible says he came to himself. That was the secret. He came to himself. You must find that place where you can come to yourself. We must, Brother Buxton, be somehow enlightened. We must somehow tonight, at the beginning of this prayer and Bible conference, we must become awakened to what there is in us and what there is in our Father's house. There's no point in us going on and living like this. We don't have to live this way when in His house there is everything that we would ever need and more. In my Father's house, in my Father's house, in my Father's house, there is plenty. There is a storehouse. But the most difficult thing to believe is that God will do it now. The most difficult thing is to believe that God will do it right now, tonight. That is the most difficult thing. I'm preaching to people here tonight. Some of you here tonight are in the throes of decision and you are struggling and there is a storm around you. There are others of you here tonight that are on the verge of being used by God. But there's some kind of a wall that has come up against you. I am here to tell you that the wall is going to come down and your storm is going to subside. Jesus sent me to tell you that He is able to do anything and to do everything and to do all things and that nothing, absolutely nothing shall be impossible to them that believe. Nothing, nothing, nothing shall be impossible to them that believe. So why don't we just believe for a moment? Lift a hand and just believe and, and worship Him and talk to Him. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I know that you are picking it up because I can feel it. Keep on right praying and talking to God for just a moment. We have time to minister to each other. We have time in this conference to help each other. We have come here to help each other. We're going to lay hands on each other. We're going to pray for each other. We're going to pull each other out of the places we're in. We're going to lift each other and we're going to go to His throne and everything's going to be all right. Everything is going to be all right. Hallelujah. The Bible says, the Bible says of the prodigal son, he arose and he began to leave that place and head for home. We need to arise tonight and begin to leave this place of bondage, whatever it is in your mind or wherever. And we need to begin to return to the thing that first brought us to his throne The lepers came to Jesus and they said, Master, if thou wilt, thou canst make me whole. And they knelt and they said, Lord, will you? And Jesus said, Yes, 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 I will. Be thou made whole. I can hear the sound of groaning in this place tonight. I can hear the sound of weeping and I can also feel there is a stir and there is something breaking. There is the sound of crumbling. There is the sound of breaking. It is the barriers. It is the walls. It is the chains. It is the bars. 
If I did not believe that this man called Jesus, who died that ignominious death upon a rugged cross, if I did not believe he could do anything and everything and all things, I would not bother to serve him. I would check out on you tonight. But I do know him, and I know that he is able to do what man cannot do. He is able to do it. But we have to be awakened to this. I think that we know about it. But I think, myself included sometimes, I don't really grasp the reality and the power of all of this. I would to God that every day when we set our feet upon the floor, whether it's carpet or hardwood or old linoleum or wherever it is, I would to God that when our feet touched the floor in the morning, we would throw our hands up and say, Good morning, Jesus! I know you, and this day is in your hands. If we could forget the mundane things of life, if we could forget the things that we have to do, and if we would just do His thing, if we could live, as Brother Buxton said today, in that constant euphoria. If we could just take what we've got here tonight and just carry this through the night and wake up within the morning and just keep the thing going all day long. I mean, fight every devil in hell that comes near to steal it. Just rebuke and just cast away and rebuke and cast away. If we could keep a hold of this, we would shake this city in the next three days. I mean, we would shake it because there would be miracle signs and wonders. There would be a light in the heavens above us. <laughs> Jesus Jesus the Holy Ghost is talking to some human hearts here tonight the Holy Ghost is speaking to us I can hear the sandaled footfall of the man from Galilee walking in the chambers and the corridors of our hearts it's a footfall that many of us know very well. But more than a footfall, there is a voice that says, You can, you can, you can. I will make a way. You people who live in this part of the world have got devils to fight here. You've got devils to fight out of, out of L.A. That Hollywood situation is a cesspool of sin. It is a central order for devils but the bible says no matter about that it says that greater is he that is within you than he that is in the world greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world I believe with all of my heart tonight that Jesus came to do exactly what Isaiah prophesied. He came to bring deliverance. He came to bring liberty. Not just a physical touch of joy in a congregation like this, but He came to deliver us mentally until our conversation would go like this. Jesus can do anything. He is able to do all things. He'll make a way for you and your husband. He'll save your daughter. He's going to bring your son back. He's going to make a way for your mother and father. He's going to do this thing. That's what I'm talking about. We don't have to go back to Egypt. We don't have to ever go back there. We need to take our heads in our hands and pray for our own brains tonight that God will do something in our brains that will somehow relate if our mind could get as excited as our bodies do sometime about all of this. It would linger. It would last. It would burn. And I close with this. Those Jews were out there dancing in the desert. They were singing in the desert. Oh, they were worshiping God. And they had their problems. And they did look back. But they kept plodding on. And they kept plodding on. Under Moses and Joshua and Caleb. And all of a sudden, in the midst of all of that joy, in the middle of all of that victory so far, they came up against the waters of the Red Sea. And there they encamped. And they could hear the friendly lapping of the tide as it came in upon the sand. They could hear the gurgling of the water pour over those rocks and then wash itself back out to sea. 
There was the wind. There was the placidness of the heaven. And there were the stars that began to come out. But somehow or other, in the background, there was a rumble and there was a roar. There was some kind of reverberation. It was like an earthquake in the distance. Was it a storm? No. No. That's not an ordinary sound. We know that sound. It is the magnified. It is the multiplied magnification of chariot wheels. And we can hear the soldiers of Pharaoh and we can hear the chants of Egypt following us. Terror swept through the camp. You talk about faith dissipating. Faith became vaporous and was gone. How could they fight the terror of Pharaoh? And his murderous host. But Moses, who had watched a bush burn and not be consumed, took a shepherd's staff that had already become a hissing serpent at the very sandaled feet of Pharaoh. He took that staff and he began to lift it. And he spoke to the God of his ancestors. And all of a sudden, from the nostrils of God, there began to blow a wind. And the wind blew through the night. And the waters of the Red Sea began to congeal and stack. And they got higher. And the path became wider and wider and wider and wider and wider. When dawn broke, as far as the eye could see, there was water roaring on either side. But there was a highway through the midst of the sea. And behind there, there was a pillar of fire that kept Pharaoh and his armies behind. The cloud was still there. Moses gave the signal. And those people began to walk. They began to run. They began to march into the water. Pharaoh made the mistake of his military career when he admonished his charioteers to follow on the heels of the children of Yahweh. He made the mistake of his military career when he gave the command. Those Jews began to rush on to the other side. But the Egyptians were in hot pursuit. And God lifted that pillar of fire. And those chariots and horses raced down into and into that road, that highway, in between the walls of water. And all of a sudden, when the last Jew and the last donkey was pulled up on the other side, there was a God in heaven that was laughing at their calamity. And all of a sudden, he stopped breathing for a moment. And when his breath stopped holding the water back, the water began to pile in. It began to cave in. And those Egyptians looked at the walls. The water came in. And the horses and the chariots were drowned in the sea. David sang about it century later and worshipped and beat his tambourine and danced in the streets and talked about what God had done for his ancestors. Friend of mine, please understand this. Please grasp this tonight when you begin your walk with God. I remember what it was like to repent. It was the most wonderful day of my life up until that point. I mean to tell you, I could feel something slip from my soul. I could feel something just fall off from me. It was like a thousand pounds left my shoulders and my back. I mean, I could feel it. Repentance is a real experience. Do you know that? It's the difference between being Forgiven and unforgiven. And when all of a sudden you are forgiven, something marvelous begins to happen inside of you. There's a new freedom. There's a song in your heart. Your thinking is different. Your head is lighter. Everything is different when you know you have been forgiven by the hand of the Lord. And you begin your journey. And you begin to walk toward this thing. But all of a sudden, you can hear the footfall of the devil in the background. He's coming after you. Hear me tonight. That devil may be able to follow you. Pharaoh could follow those Jews through the water. But he could not get through the water. Because he was not a believer. The devil may have followed you. He may have hounded you. He may have tried to keep you from getting this. But I want to tell you something. When you put your foot over a baptistry. When you walk down in to the water. You left the devil on the other side. You left him standing on the other side. He cannot get into the water. He cannot go through the water with
with you. He cannot get through the water. It is the name of Jesus. It is the water that separates you. He's got it. He understands where I'm going. He knows what I'm talking about. I'm saying to you tonight, if you have been to the water in Jesus' name, He's on the other side. You are delivered. You are set free. You never have to go back. You never have to be the same again. We're on this side. We're on this side, people. We are on this side of the river. We're on this side of the water. We're never going to be the same. We're never going to go back. We're never going to go back. We're never going to go back. I don't have to go back. I don't have to go back. You don't have to go back. We don't ever have to go back. We're never going to be the same again. Oh. I've simply come to tell you tonight, I've simply come to tell you, you are already delivered. You are already set free. You'll never be the same again. It's just that the devil has lied to some of you. And you think he got through the water, but he didn't. Because he can't. He can't. He can't. It was the water that separated Israel from Egypt. It is the water that separates us from this world. We are cut off from Egypt. And we're never going back. We are going to conquer the giants. And we're going to eat the fruit of the land. We are on our way to the promised land. That's why I give you license tonight to dance, to shout, to worship, to run, to leap for joy to sing whatever you want to do because you are free you are free if you believe it I want you to stand and raise your hands and say I am free God has spoken to many of us in this place tonight. God has spoken to many of us. If God has spoken to you and you have wrestled with something and you have believed a lie, but a light has gone on in your understanding tonight and you see that you are delivered and set free. I want you to come from where you are to this altar prayer. And don't kneel, but I want you to stand and lift your hands and worship Him. If you need a touch of God to convince you further that you are delivered, I want you to come. If you need the Holy Ghost tonight, I want you to come. Here's a woman right here who needs the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Are there others here tonight? 
There's a young man standing right there. You have blonde hair, you have a mustache, you have a plaid shirt, you have a dark trim on your t-shirt. The hand of God is reaching for you. I felt that when I sat over there tonight behind you, something's reaching for you that's bigger than life, that is greater than anything you've ever known. And we invite you, we invite you to come to Him. You'll never be the same. You will never ever be the same. There are others here tonight who need the touch of God on their life. Hallelujah. Would you lift your hands and worship the Lord? That's it, son. That's wonderful. That is wonderful. That is wonderful. Those of you who know how to pray, would you come and stand behind these who are here? Would you give your voice? Would you transmit your faith to them in this place tonight? In the name of Jesus. 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 There are others who still need to come. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. I'll never be the same again. I will never be the same again. Never be the same again. 